Hey guys, Kyle Studer. I mentor final expense and mortgage protection agents to become top producers in the life insurance industry. I'm doing a pros and cons video of being an independent life insurance agent today. Uh, Sunday morning, I released the pros and cons of working in a captive agency. And I'm doing my best to be, you know, non biased and objective as possible. So I work as an independent, so, you know, I'm biased towards that. But <clears throat> I think there's benefits to both. And I think the biggest thing is, uh, like I say in a lot of my videos, trusting your gut. Uh, it depends on the type of person you are. So be honest with yourself about yourself and pick what you believe is the best fit for you. So pros and cons of being an independent agent, uh, just like the other video, I'll start with the pros first, some that I listed. So first thing I wrote down uh, was creative control. Um, what this means to me is you are running your own business, um, which, you know, when I first started my insurance career as a brand new agent, um, that wouldn't have meant a whole lot. Even with my new agents, they probably don't care too much about creative control. You know, they're just trying to learn how to sell. They want to follow the system and, and get started and see if they can make money. Uh, so this would be more for like experienced agents who are who have gotten to the point where they're comfortable selling. Creative control is something that would be more valuable to you, in my opinion, because the way I describe it, it's like I have an upline, right? We all have an upline, even on the independent side. Uh, everybody's got an upline, but you don't really even know about my upline. And you're not going to really know about my upline. And that's that's what I would say. That's how I describe creative control. So it's not like I'm a cog in the wheel of somebody else's business. I am independent. I am selling life insurance, hiring others to sell life insurance. I can sell final expense. I can sell no final expense, I can specialize in mortgage protection, I can do IULs, annuities, I can do Medicare, I could do whatever I wanted to do with my agency, which is pretty, which is pretty cool. And it was new to me coming from uh, a different business model. So creative control is uh, probably my favorite thing about it. Uh, I've become more creative. Uh, yeah, no pun intended, uh, just free, liberated. It's liberating to not have to succumb to this way of doing things. Now, I'll reiterate before I move to the next point. When you're a brand new agent and you're learning how to sell, it's good to follow the system. Do everything that your upline or your mentor tells you to do. Don't be creative. That's not the time to be creative. That's not the time to think outside the box. When you're learning how to sell and you're trying to make it in this business, there's no business for you to be cre creative or uh, innovative. Okay, so <clears throat> creative control is my favorite thing. Branding yourself, building your business. This is what it comes down to. Building your business with your vision. Nobody else's. You're not building somebody else's dream. You're not building somebody else's vision. You, as an experienced agent, decide what is good for you. What do you want? What do you want? Do you want to recruit agents? Do you want to cross-sell Medicare? Do you want to cross-sell annuities? Do you want to master single premium whole life? You can do whatever you want to do. So creative control was my number one thing. Number two was top pay. So pay is 
Uh, obviously important. We all are independent contractors. Even if you're a captive agent, you're generally on a 1099 contract. So uh, top pay, you can negotiate your contracts based on previous production. Okay, so I start my brand new agents with no experience at 100%. Those who are more experienced, those who are rock stars, can go significantly higher in my agency. So top pay. <clears throat> if, you, if, if you watch sports, if you, especially football, I'm a big football fan. Uh, if you can't tell, I've got stuff all in the background about the Eagles. Um, I compared this to like, the rookie contract, when a when a rookie gets drafted, so someone plays at Ohio State or college, they get drafted into the NFL. Their first four years, they're on a rookie contract, right? There's they're they're making less money because they're on a rookie contract. And then after that deal's done, they'll either re-sign a bigger deal based on their performance. They'll re-sign a bigger deal with their current team. Or they'll become what's called a free agent, <clears throat> where it's an open market, and there's 32 NFL teams or 31 other NFL teams who may be interested in this person's ability and talents. So they bid on him, and he can negotiate, he and his agent can negotiate and get what's the best deal for their family. And in that business, you know, your, your athletic ability you're only at your prime, you're only at your peak for so long. So it's important to get paid while you can get paid. And while I think the prime of an insurance agent's career is much longer, you know, you don't need to be in peak physical condition, but uh, I do still think you should get paid while you can get paid. You know, if you've got a mortgage, uh, it's valuable for you to make more money. If you've got bills, if you've got children, if you've got things you'd like to do, things that take money, which in this day and age uh, is just about everything, costs money. We outsource everything, most of us. So why not make more money for selling life insurance? And I'm going to give you an example. So at my old, uh, in my old business model, um, I was... Uh, a broker but I was captive they said I was not captive but I was so I worked with you know a handful of carriers I could sell mutual of Omaha Foresters uh, you know Great Western AIG there's all the popular ones right all the popular ones so I could sell some different carriers which was nice it was a pretty good product blend not nearly as good as I thought but so I worked my way up, right? A couple levels in this um, other model. And where I ended up, you know, I was writing almost every month 10,000 to 20,000. 10,000 was generally the minimum, okay? There were some months where I didn't work very hard and I, and I did less than that. Um, but if I sold, 10,000, you know, I wasn't really busting my butt. Um, so if I was working, it was 15 to 20,000. Issue paid. So if you issue pay 15,000, then you've got to submit generally 18 to 20,000. That means I sold 18 to 20,000, but within that month time frame, I only got 15,000 or whatever number. Issue paid. Company issued the policy, client made their first premium payment. So that's a that's a good amount of volume. There's a there's a, a low number of agents, uh, low percentages that do that kind of volume. Okay, and I said that because at my old company, I was making seventy five percent on term products at that kind of volume. I was making 75% on term and 62% on whole life products, okay? So when I went independent, became a free agent, so to speak, um, <clears throat> I like doubled my contract almost. So 
It's, well, I did, actually. I did double it. So, it's unbelievable to me. Unbelievable that you can do that. I'm thankful for it. Uh, it's made a big difference, as you can imagine. Just imagine if you were a nurse doing doing good, you know, making $25 an hour, and you're happy, but then you realize, hey, this other place will pay me, my friend says, they'll pay me $53 an hour. And I can work from home, and like there's a little bit more flexibility. That's kind of what this equates to. Um, and for some of you who are at a lower contract than that, you know, I was at 62 and 75%, and I was above average. I wasn't a brand new agent. I was, you know, four and a half years into the business and I was pretty experienced. I had won carrier trips. I had sold a fair amount of insurance and that's how high I was able to go. Um, I have friends that went a little higher. They, they went the next level up. So they were like 80 and they were probably at 80 and like 68%, something like that. Um, so top pay, that's important. And I'm going to give you an example. So a couple weeks ago on telesales, I called a former client from just a year or two ago, and we wrote a policy, okay? So in the past, I wrote, I wrote some kind of policy on her to cover her uh, mortgage. And I just called her, did an annual review. Things had changed. So we changed her policy, okay? And this client <coughs> was paying, uh, it was above average premium, okay? It was, a, it was a pretty large sale. I think it was like $170 a month, the new policy I wrote. And just for kicks and giggles, I did the math on my new contract level once I became a free agent and went independent. And then I looked at my old number, what I would have made. I'm not exaggerating. At my old company, my commission would have been one thousand five hundred and fifty some dollars. Independent, my commission was two thousand five hundred and fifty some dollars. It was legitimately one thousand dollars difference in commission on one sale. So that is an example of what you could not be bringing in for your family because a thousand dollars is a mortgage payment that's a mortgage payment i know not every sale is that big but the difference in pay is it doesn't matter if you sell a policy for thirty dollars a month and you're getting paid x amount of money and then as an independent you sell a policy for $30 a month and you're getting paid twice as much as you used to. You get paid twice as much, roughly, on every policy. So that's good for you. It's good for your family. So top pay, covered that. Uh, another pro, there's more lead vendors. So... I'm not telling you, hey, well, like a cap, some captive agency say, hey, you buy your leads through us. And then some of them resell your leads to other agents. So they're making money off of the lead, you know, three or four times. Uh, so there's more lead vendors. It's non-biased. I don't, like if you come to work with my agency, I don't care if you work Facebook, final expense. I'll tell you which vendors I recommend based on experience. Or if you want to do direct mail, I'll tell you, hey, contact this lead vendor. You might want to look at something like this. So there's more lead vendors. It's non-biased, and you have the right to go about and check out new lead sources and see if there's anything better out there. See, what most captive agencies want to tell you is, you know, we got it going on. You know, we got these leads. Nobody's got leads like what we got. And you go out and you start selling insurance with them and you think, man, these are good leads, you know, but that's because you've never worked any other leads. You know, they're all about the same, in my opinion. You can buy leads that are not as good, but there are leads that are just as good as everybody else's leads. 
they all do the same thing, right? When you buy a Facebook final expense lead, most of their contact forms look about the same. There's 10 or 11 data points that they collect information on. It's always generally the same information, right? They all copy each other. Okay, so not gonna spend a lot of time on that. There's more lead vendors. That's good for you. <clears throat> um, incredible carriers. This is important. Underwriting is amazing. And, and it's just kind of like, I don't have to go on too much about it. It's like if I ran a car lot and all I sold were Fords. I only sell Fords. Ford is fine. There's a lot of people who like Ford. You will still sell cars. That's good. Let's say over here, option B would be I sell, I have a car lot, I sell Fords, Lexus, Mercedes, Chevy, uh, Chrysler, right? All of them. Toyota. Well, I can, this is just common sense. It's not good or bad. I can accommodate more people when I sell all the brands of vehicles. Some people are Toyota people. Some people are Mazda people. Some people are diehard Chevy, diehard Ford. That's great. Whatever they want, whatever they need, I want to be able to accommodate them. Okay. So in life insurance, if you've got a client that has COPD and you only have one product and you're a captive agent, there's it's likely that they're going to have a two-year waiting period. And that is not the most competitive product. I got a carrier you do a telephonic application with in the house. They're approved immediately over the phone or they're declined. And they cover COPD day one. There's no waiting period, right? You get standard coverage with COPD. Um, congestive heart failure. A lot of people can't cover it. A lot of people have to write guaranteed issue products. Sometimes you can get a true graded where the client has 30% their first year, 70% their second year, 100% their third year of the uh, policy. And here's the thing. You don't take a pay cut. You don't have to take a pay cut writing this true graded policy for somebody with congestive heart failure. So... That's a big deal. You don't take a 30 or 40% uh, cut in your commission because of this client's heart condition. So incredible carriers, it's good to have a, a variety so you can cover different health ailments because if you're an agent, you're going to run into it, especially if you're in the final expense market. You know, you know, you, if, you, if you've had experience selling, you see the health, kind of health questions that that are the kind of health ailments you run into. Diabetic neuropathy, insulin dependent, hospital two months ago. You know, we've got companies that ask, have you been in the hospital in the last year, the last six months? Are you currently in the hospital? So you can, like the other day I had a woman who had been hospitalized like uh, <coughs> a month ago. She was pretty healthy. She was healthy, uh, other than this hospital question. So generally, I had this lead carrier that would cover her, and they would have based on health, but they had a hospital question of the last six months. So I had to write a different company, but this different company asks if they've been in the, if they're currently in the hospital. So we could say no, she's not, and we got her approved for level coverage. So. She didn't have a waiting period. I didn't have to get a cut in commission. Uh, it's good. It's good to have more vehicles or more policies to offer. Okay? So another pro is the incredible carriers. Um, <clears throat> real quick, you can win trips selling life insurance. If you're an experienced agent, you've probably heard of that. Um, if you're a new agent, part of like a MLM uh, business model, you've likely heard of this as well. They promote trips more than probably anything else. Um, as an independent, it's less issue paid premium 
to win trips. Okay, so some companies, some captive agencies, you need to sell like a hundred, a hundred and ten, a hundred and twenty thousand dollars in premium to win a trip. As an independent, you can sell seventy thousand, eighty thousand dollars is going to win you a lot of trips as an independent. So seventy thousand dollars issue paid, eighty thousand dollars issue paid is going to get you in the ballpark of winning a trip for you and a guest, all expense paid. So it's less issue paid premium to win trips. The lowest I've heard of is forty thousand. If you write 40000 with this one carrier, they'll send you on a trip. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Um, <coughs> the, last, the last pro I've got here for being independent, if you decide to build an agency, okay? This is about recruiting. So I, my first business model, I recruited a lot of people. And it wasn't really a good deal for people, which I didn't really know when I was recruiting people. So it was a combination of a couple things. First of all, probably me, the system, the lack of opportunity. Uh, a lot of people don't pan out. A lot of people don't last. So, and a lot of people know it's not a good deal because they had more perspective than me. So <clears throat> big pro of recruiting on the independent side is authentic I wrote authentic easier okay easier is maybe the wrong word choice but coming from where I came from I really think it's accurate um, I'm not telling you recruiting and building an agency is easy but when when I'm starting my brand new agents off at hundred percent and I'm giving them all the renewals Basically, when I'm not trying to pull the wool over their eyes, I can be transparent. I can be honest. I can tell the truth. I can, I'm giving them, I'm adding value to them. And in most cases, more so than the competition. So from a negotiation standpoint, it's easier to recruit. Because when you're transparent and authentic and you're not hiding anything, people pick up on that. So let's say I recruit you, right? I tell you very little. I recruit you into the business. You pay $150 in Ohio to get your life insurance license. And then after that, you find out that you're supposed to be buying leads. Yeah, it's like, oh, it starts like $200 a week, like. Most people don't have that. I mean, that's the first thing. Most people were like, dude, you didn't tell me that. Like, it's $150 for a license. You didn't tell me I was going to spend $800 a month in leads. So you're telling me I don't have to, but really it's going to be hard to succeed. Well, well, I didn't have the money to do this. Why didn't you just tell me up front? Why, why weren't they transparent? So... A lot of organizations do that. So I would say the last pro of uh, being independent is recruiting, building an agency. Uh, you have the advantage of being transparent, honest, authentic, and adding a lot of value. By the way, agents get into this business to make money for their family. That's why I'm in it. You know, a big part of the reason why I left my last company, yeah, there were some things said. Yeah, there were some red flags, no doubt. I've put videos out on that. But another big reason was Kiara and I found out we were pregnant. We were going to be having a child. And that was another motivating factor. It's like, dude, I got these red flags going on. I got a, I got a baby coming. I got to make more money. It's time to stop playing games. It's time to stop uh, funding somebody else's dream. Me pouring money into something that wasn't showing me results. So, recruiting, 
is way better, way better. Totally different conversations. People are coming to me, talking to me about getting started in my agency. Why is that? Well, I can put content out. I can put videos out. I can put postings out. Um, do you notice a lot of these uh, multiple marketing companies or captive agencies, they do the same, but they can't, they can't openly compete amongst independents. They recruit warm market. They recruit people who have no perspective. Like independent agents aren't going to leave the independent side and go captive. Not successful independent agents. They don't go to the captive side ever. So something to consider. Um, <clears throat> that is that. So that's the, that finishes up the pros. What are the cons, Kyle? Yeah, all that sounds great. You sound like you're selling me really hard, but Kyle, you're biased. You're independent. So why should I listen to you? Well, here's some cons, okay? So I'm going to try to balance this. And like I'm acknowledging I am biased. So I understand um, why people would feel like I am biased because I'm telling you <laughs> I am biased. So, but I did come up with some cons. So actually one of my new agents said this a couple weeks ago. And I, it, I thought it was put well. I think it was well said. He said, man, going independent is a little bit, it reminds me a little bit of the wild, wild west. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I could see that. Because, you know, unless you have somebody that you can trust that can help you navigate the waters, it's going to feel like the wild, wild west. Um, there's just, there's less control. There's no local office. There's nobody telling you what to do, when to move. Um, so there's support available, but you've got to be motivated. You've got to reach out and get the support. You know, we don't like, well, at least the way I run my agency, I don't babysit people. I'm not going to text you every day or every week say, hey, what's up? Are you on this Zoom call? Um, so wild, wild west, what do I mean? Well. When I left my old organization, I had no idea how I knew I could make, I knew I could get bigger contracts. I had no idea how much bigger I could get. Okay. Um, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what IMO to look at. I didn't know uh, who would give me creative control. I didn't know who I could trust. So, it was difficult. What I ended up doing was I found three people who offered me the best contract I could find. And then I interviewed with all three of them. And then I picked the one to work with that I felt the best about. I thought was the most transparent. Um, I just trusted my gut. <laughs> so uh, if you are considering leaving your captive agency or your multi-level marketing structure. Um, it can be a little bit like the wild, wild west. Um, I can help you. And I don't mean, hey, I can recruit you. I will help you. Um, I would be interested probably in recruiting you. I'm not interested in bringing everybody on board, but uh, I will help you. Okay, so I can tell you other people to talk to, uh, other organizations, other IMOs that I have heard are good, and then I can tell you the benefits of working at my agency. But whether you work with me or not, I will help you navigate the waters. Okay, so <clears throat> Wild Wild West is the first con. Con number two, this was difficult. This took a lot of time. I had to find somebody that I felt I could trust. And I am very, very happy. I love how the setup works. I love uh, I love my business. I love how it runs. And I love that nobody is babysitting me or micromanaging me. So, but that's, the, that's a con. You've got to find somebody you can trust. So my goal in these videos oftentimes is to, well, always to appear 
to be trustworthy. And I'm trying to do it with, uh, by being authentic and being honest, being as objective as possible, and hoping to convey that I am really trying to help the little guy, the, the agent who's going from 30% and wants to go to 100%. Somebody who's kind of been taken advantage of, I want to help them. I want to give them true information, good information that will benefit them immediately. Okay? So you've got to find somebody that you can trust. Uh, another con of being independent, no local office generally, no not as much hands-on training generally, not always. So with my um with my agency, you know, in Ohio, I can be more hands-on. You know, I can go on ride-alongs. Agents can come ride along in my car and watch me run appointments. Um, there's more hands-on within my state. But, you know, I'm not going to go out to Cali. I'm not going to go uh, out to Texas to do some ride-alongs. Uh, so they can come to me, but so they're, they're, that can be a con. A lot of times there's no local office, there's no micromanagement, there's no uh, hands-on element. Uh, but here's one thing I would argue with that. You can eventually create that. So that's part of, I think, what I want to do. You know, eventually, I live in Dayton, Ohio, I would like to have an office or maybe just a space that we rent out once a week to do training because a lot of people benefit from that the camaraderie the team aspect um, you know forming relationships you know do some training go grab some food see you next week um, it's a good thing I mean I enjoyed it we did that a lot at my last uh, company and it was it was nice. You you make a lot of friends. Uh, you get to kind of talk to them. Uh, you get more time to chit chat and to build like a more of a real relationship. So that's good. So even as an independent, while it won't be there immediately, you can build that eventually, right? With your team of agents or with uh, just friends in the business, you can get into networking uh, events. You can supplement that relationship and that team aspect in a couple different ways. So that is the second to last con. The last con I wrote here was, um, and this is important for some people, not for all people, there's no external motivation, um, no micromanagement, which is a bad thing for some people. For me, I like that. I don't want to be micromanaged, and there are people like that. And ideally, those are the agents I'm looking for, the ones that don't want to be micromanaged, they want to do their own thing, they want to be independent. Hey, dude, I'll call you when I need you. If I need your help, I'll send you an email, but don't like call me every day and like try to get me to produce more. Don't try to you know, turn me into what you want me to be. Let me be me. Uh, but some people benefit from micromanagement. Some people benefit from uh, the external motivation. You know, some some people benefit from you know, like getting text messages like, "Good job," you know, you wrote so x and x amount of annual premium. Great job. Group text. Hey guys, you know, Susie Q wrote you know fifteen thousand this week. Uh, that's that's the record, blah, blah, blah. That's the most uh, business written this year by anybody in a single week. And, you know, that that helps some people. That gets them going. Um, so that would be the other con of being independent is I would say when you go to the independent side, you can count on there being a little less external motivation. So that's it, guys. That is my pros and cons of being an independent uh, agent in the life insurance industry. If you want to check out more about what I do, you can go to kylestuder.com. 
It talks about uh, a couple different things that I mentioned in here, and it tells you some, some basics about working in my agency. I'm also on YouTube. If you could subscribe, if you like this content, uh, please subscribe. And you can also request, like, hey, Kyle, talk about this. Uh, if you could, if you know anything about this, make a video. Um, that always uh, makes it fun for me because I'm trying to think of what am I going to do my next video on. So hope you guys have a good day, and I will talk to you later. Bye.